So for those uh, my subscribers that don't know, a few days ago I had a, a conversation over uh, Google Hangout with uh, Eric Orwell, and we discussed uh, potentiality and actuality uh, in the context of metaphysics, uh, information theory, offered with Whitehead's uh, process ontology. Um, pretty abstract discussion. You might find it interesting. I'll post a link in the description. This video, though, will be a response to uh, Eric's recent video about the hard problem of consciousness, which, of course, is um, surrounding the issue of how subjective mental experience relates to objective material existence. Um, it's framed always in, in this sort of Cartesian way, uh, where you have two substances, each with fundamentally nothing to do with the other, nothing in common with the other. You know, the um, interior domain of, um, of thinking, uh, thinking substance, uh, and the exterior domain uh, of um, uh, material substance. And, of course, when framed in this way, trying to understand how these two things might relate is hard, to say the least. Um, I wouldn't really want to attempt to answer or solve the hard problem. I'd want to repose the question, uh, reframe the problem um, from a different metaphysical perspective, uh, which would be something more akin to Alfred North Whitehead ontology where um, you never get a concrete, actual occasion of, of existence or occasion of experience without both mental and physical um, aspects to it. So all the way up and down the scale of uh, organization in the universe, you're dealing with um, processes which can be described both in terms of a mental pole or aspect and a physical pole or aspect. Um, so you no longer have two separate substances in need of reconciliation. Um, you only need to understand how this um, polarized process of complexification can lead from simpler forms uh, of, of experience. Um, experience being sort of the inheritance of the past and the anticipation of the future. How you move from simple forms of that to more complex forms, which take on consciousness when you're when you're talking about, um, you know, high-grade organisms, animals like like human beings uh, and primates and higher mammals and what have you. Um, so, you know, one of the problems with the traditional way of framing our problem of consciousness is that it loses. Uh, the intermediary space or the in-between realm uh, where instead of dealing with distinct, definite qualia of um, color or uh, shapeliness or uh, what have you, um, there's more of a sense of the vague feeling of inheritance from the surrounding environment um, that isn't yet conscious. And the way this problem is normally examined uh, in, in Western philosophy is, I think, too abstract in that it assumes a, a ready-made conscious observer in some sense separate from or alienated from both its body and its world. When we experience ourselves concretely and, and we sort of reflect upon um, the ebbs and flows of, of our experience throughout the day, the course of a normal day or 24-hour cycle, we're only conscious in that sort of egoic, Cartesian, uh, rational way for you know, maybe a few minutes uh, each day. Most of the time, we're kind of on um, autopilot. We have this sort of instinctual um, relationship with the surrounding world where our reactions occur before we have a chance to reflect on any of it. Um, and you know, these reactions are, are a result of the habitual forms of perception and action um, that we've come to accumulate over the course of our own lives and over the course of the phylogenetic history of our species and, you know, going back to the beginning of, of life and the beginning of the universe, ultimately. Um, so when, when we frame the problem in a Cartesian way, we lose that in-between space um, of 
vague feeling before you have definite qualia. Um, qualia only emerge sort of after the fact of our immediate experience when we begin to consciously and linguistically reflect on the nature of that experience. And it's a result of getting lost in that reflective capacity that we have that we then pose this problem such that it's hard, it's not impossible to solve. Um, so, one more thing I wanted to say about the neural correlates of consciousness, that, uh, that sort of approach uh, to, to trying to narrow this gap between mind and matter that Eric was talking about. Um, and instead of trying to figure out how the mind or how the brain would cause mind or consciousness, the approach is to just correlate mental states with brain states or mental activities with brain uh, neurochemical activities. And I think there's, you know, definitely reason to explore that uh, as, a, as a paradigm within the neurosciences. We can learn a lot doing that. But there's, there's an inherent limit in the sense that um, our cognition uh, is not simply located in the brain. Much of, of our thinking abilities require um, the augmentation of various tools um, in the world that, that we use, like, like pen and, and or paper, uh, pencil and paper, or computers, calculators, um, you know, counting with our fingers even, um, such that we're never going to find the source or the cause, the origin of consciousness or, or cognition or mind by only looking in the skull. Um, you know, the brain is in a body, and the body is in a world, uh, and the brain and body have evolved um, over millions and billions of years in such a way that they're structurally coupled with the surrounding environment. Uh, and, and have found ways to utilize features of the environment, in, in the case of humans, to, to sculpt and mold in a very detailed and delicate way um, tools out of environmental materials um, that then fundamentally transform the ways that we're capable of thinking, uh, the ways that we're capable of being conscious. So in some sense, mind is extended, which contradicts the Cartesian paradigm of mind being um, interior and not extended. And, you know, I think reposing the problem in, in these terms is really important if we hope to make any progress in understanding, uh, you know, the nature of both the mental and physical aspects of, of reality. So for what it's worth, uh, thanks for listening.